she took a position as professor at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. Um, it's really unusual for me to be introducing somebody from a medical school that is actually younger than ours, but it's a relatively new medical school. Um, and she has been um, there establishing a very similar program to what she did in Venezuela. So we're very fortunate to have her here in the United States leading a similar efforts. Um, let's see, so she, she has many director roles. Um, she's earned a Pioneers Director Award uh, to study sort of the interaction between where you live, your neighborhood, and your risk factors for Alzheimer's in, in a Hispanic population. So her focus is really how do we uh, access under-researched, underrepresented populations. And so her wealth of experience is, is broadening our horizons in terms of how to do this type of research and what is important in terms of risk factors. So novelty in two different axes, if you will. Um, let me get her, the other titles that she's, she's um, uh, director of the Memory Disorder Center at UT Rio Grande Valley. Um, and she's also direct, she re she's received funding not just for her research, but also for guiding mentorship. So she is uh, in charge of the uh, Alzheimer's Disease Research Center for Minority Aging Research. And so it's a grant from the National Institute of Aging that provides support for investigators to train underrepresented investigators in how to write proposals and in how to have a successful research career. So not only is she doing the work in the community, making an impact in research, she's also growing the pool of researchers who are gonna go on and, be, and continue this type of research going forward. So I, I hope you can tell I'm enthusiastic. I'm so excited to hear what Dr. Maestra is, is gonna share with us today, and let's all welcome her. Well, thank you very much. I, I, that was very, very generous, and I have to say I have enjoyed my day-to-day -day intensive, but uh, I've learned a lot, and I'm bringing home not one, but many ideas I got here on how to improve our programs. So, um, I acknowledge that we are in the Tutelo Monacan people's homeland and recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. They have stewarded this land for many generations and I would like to thank them and pay my respects to elders, both past and present. I also recognize that slave black people generated revenue and resources used to establish Virginia Tech and were prohibited from attending until 1953. I admire the institutional and individual commitment to Ut Prosim in the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence that Virginia Tech commits to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. Um, disclosures, I have only my funding from NIH and from the Texas Alzheimer's Research and Care Consortium. And I also have a potential conflict that I'm obligated to, to share every time I do a presentation uh, because I founded a nonprofit called Funda Conciencia. But a management plan has been created to preserve objectivity in research in accordance with UTRGB policy. I want to share with you why I do what I do, um, share with you the UTRGB Alzheimer's Initiative, maybe uh, not only research collaborations, but maybe some of our students, maybe some of you want to come and spend some time with us and we'll be delighted uh, to have exchange of students and faculty, of course. I'm gonna talk to you about blood pressure, blood pressure viability, our cities, all this in relationship to neurodegeneration and hopefully we'll have some time for dialogue. How do you think up the right question at the right time? I've been asked this a lot. Some questions travel around the world for ages and seem to end up in the minds of different people right at the same time. 
even though they don't know each other and they live far apart. When two dogs run together, they quickly start jumping at the same time. When two people walk together, their legs easily move up and down at the same time. We tune to the rhythm of the day and night, to the seasons. We tune to each other and celebrate when we can. We tune to the world, whether we notice it or not. Tuning to life is about tuning into others, other human beings and other animals and plants. If we do, do not recognize the rhythm of others, this rhythm can be like a concrete wall that prevents us from engaging. Sometimes such a wall of ignorance even generates hate. So in this rhythm of life, I am studying blood pressure viability. And I think blood pressure viability contains the rhythm of daily life and of our dreams. I wanted to share the UTRGB initiative, some part of it, just to uh, open the doors for you. How can we tune to and interact with something or someone what, that we don't even know? So I want to introduce you the people that support the initiative and that has supported me since I came. Those in the very top line are our research scholars. All of them are assistant professors that never thought that they will work in Alzheimer's and now all of them have been funded and are working and contributing from studying caregiving uh, of Mexican Americans from transcriptomics, genomics, exposome. The people in the second file are our heavy lifter, the chairs, the deans, the people that are, have, were doing research, not in Alzheimer's though. They were doing research in many other areas. The third row is the people that actually are dealing with the patients or with our data sets uh, from our project coordinators, medical assistants. And the very last person in the third row is a philosopher who is always putting her finger in our eyes. So we open our eyes. And the fourth row are our collaborators outside the university, mostly outside of the university. Um, the very, at uh, the very end is Dr. Sura Sechadri in San Antonio, my partner in the ADRC, um, and uh, uh, last, um, second to last is Dr. Gina uh, Lobasi, which I'm gonna share some data that we generated with her today. These are some of our campuses. The Brownsville campus is the most beautiful campus I've ever seen, really. It's beautiful. It was built by an architect focused on a colonial architecture and the use of real uh, materials, vernacular materials. This, the, the, uh, the one, uh, it's a medical school, which is in Edinburgh, and um, the very bottom is our brand new Institute of Neuroscience in which we um, move in no end of November of last year. And this is just to uh, show you uh, that we have a full building. The green area is the imaging area that has the, the MRI, the DAG, and the PET, and the yellow area are clinical offices, and we have a pharmacy as well. And the second floor is all research the green is where I sit and my staff, and the pink is all our um, suites for research, and the bottom, a different type of rooms, multi-use uh, rooms for the community, and the blue and lavender are for uh, neurology, is the blue, and the lavender neuroscience faculty. We have 35, uh, clinics along the border makes 
Texas Mex Tex border, and uh, we are in the process of converting each of them in recruitment sites for Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. Let me tell you now a blood, uh, about blood pressure, and, and I promise you all this will make sense somehow. So the very first um, bar correspond to high blood, high systolic blood pressure, and this is the global uh, burden of disease data, and, you can, and this is the very, the A graph in the top correspond to women, and um, B corresponds to, uh, they say males, we like to say men. And, um, and in men, high systolic blood pressure is only second to tobacco exposure in terms of death. And when we look at about Alzheimer's disease, the Lancet Commission 2020 report mentioned uh, that 40% of cases of Alzheimer's could be prevented if these 12 conditions were avoided or treated. And one of them is uh, the most treatable, it's hypertension. We know hypertension uh, causes brain damage and accelerated brain aging. Here you see, let me see. Okay. Okay, here you can see a healthy brain aging, these two individuals about the same age, and the office blood pressure, 24 hour blood pressure, daytime, nighttime, all within normal parameters, and this is an individual that is quite hypertensive with all these indices uh, over, um, uh, with severe hypertension, and the age of 67, uh, this brain has not only is, uh, signs of small vessel disease, such as silent brain infarcts, uh, white matter hyperintensities, cerebral microbleeds, but uh, in general, the brain um, has, is older. So before I continue, um, I have to tell you a few things. Um, the most basic is that the methods to measure blood pressure. And I guess you are a new generation, maybe you know this, but I know I didn't know this until relatively a few years ago. So when I studied medicine, we used to have the, uh, the mercury sphingomanometer, and we used to hear the sounds and get systolic and diastolic. When you start hearing systolic, and then when you stop hearing diastolic. There were some other sounds in the middle, but basically systolic and diastolic. This method is called auscultatory. But now we don't have uh, these uh, mercury sphingomanometers, and we have all scultatory uh, monitors. Those are the omroms, the uh, Welsh Allen, the machines that we press the bottom, and the uh, cuff inflates. And then you see the systolic and diastolic. But the truth is that these machines do not measure systolic or diastolic. Did you know that? They don't measure systolic or diastolic. They measure what's called the mean arterial blood pressure. The mean arterial blood pressure, then the machine has an algorithm and derives the systolic and diastolic blood pressure. So what you are getting is the mean arterial blood pressure. And I repeat that because it's hard to believe. How come this machine don't have the mean arterial blood pressure or mass. Some machines have like the Dynamax, but not the ones that are portable. They only have the systolic and diastolic. So what's the point? Aren't they more useful? You don't have to listen, you just press the button and you know. So what's the point? Besides, 
the algorithm by which they take the, the mean arterial blood pressure and estimate the systolic and diastolic is secret. They don't share that. So each uh, brand has their own algorithms to estimate the systolic and diastolic blood pressure. Okay, but then you use, you say you just use the same machine, the same brand all the time. But it's not only that. This is the um, auscultatory, using the auscultatory method, uh, the systolic blood pressure, and this is the diastolic. This is the, yeah, diastolic, and this is the systolic. And you know what is this? This is the error of the machine. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. So, so this number is 30 millimeters of mercury. Of mercury. So you have 30 up, or, and maybe, you know, 25 of error, millimeters of mercury. So you only have that, 30. What do you think about that? It's bad, huh? That's what you are treating if you are only using this. And the diastolic, it's about, okay, it's less. It's only 10 to 20 millimeters of mercury. Happier? Not really, right? Okay. So what's the gold standard? The gold standard for every society, any professional society, American Heart Association, American College of Cardiologists, the European Society for Hypertension, Japanese, Australian, is the 24-hour blood pressure monitoring. What? Yes, that's the gold standard. That's what every individual over 50 should have at least once per year to know if they, if they have hypertension. And this is the best method to see if somebody that is taking antihypertensive medications is actually controlled. But not only because you can get, so during the day inflates every, we use it for research, every 15 minutes during the day and every 30 minutes at night. New machines come with accelerometer and they change automatically. And so they also, of course, take the mean arterial blood pressure and estimate systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure. But because you have so many measurements in 24 hours, you have a better estimate of the real blood pressure of the person. But not only you get the number, the level, but you also get the pattern. You get the pattern of how, how high or how low is the blood pressure at day, during the day where the individual is in their real life or sleeping without any activity, where you can measure the system as it is in rest. Some people say this is the real um, blood pressure. You can also derive the variability of blood pressure. And I'll tell you why this is important. So I do not know what to tell you, but when I tell this to my patients, they feel betrayed. In fact, some of my colleagues say, really? How come I didn't know this? Because we are trapped between the whole companies, I think. And that's the beauty of being in an academic center. So more than 10 years ago, we met together with Dr. Jan Stassen, who was leading, who is leading a consortia of about uh, 13 countries that have collected 24-hour blood pressure monitoring. We wanted to know what are the thresholds of systolic, diastolic, or mean. We want to know what better predicts the outcomes. So several articles have, have come out. But this article that I'm gonna initially talk to you about came out in JAMA in 2019. And uh, uh, you see that uh, there was about uh, 2,900 uh, deaths. And this was after following up about uh, 13,000 people over 10 years. So that's 
quite robust and included different countries. So when we look at total mortality, total mortality is the extreme outcome, right? I mean, it's the extreme, yes, no. And we also want to look for predictors of total mortality. So it's a very hard one. If you have something there, then you start looking in other type of outcomes. So when we adjusted by cohort sex, age, BMI, smoking, drinking, serum cholesterol, antihypertensive drug intake, history of cardiovascular disease, and diabetes mellitus, then conventional uh, systolic blood pressure, meaning with the mercury, the uh, sphingomanometer was significant, the automated was significant, and the ones that measure 24 hours, daytime, nighttime blood pressure, and deep in ratio, meaning the ratio between the night and the day. Because at night, the normal condition is that blood pressure goes down at least 10%. This is called deeper or deeping. But when you adjust for 24 hours blood pressure, systolic blood pressure, you still get some get significant from the, from the conventional. The automatic office systolic blood pressure does not predict anything. And the daytime, nighttime, and deep in ratio are significant. When we adjust instead for nighttime, again, the automatic office systolic blood pressure is not predictive of anything. It's conventional it is. And the 24 hours and daytime is not significant, neither the deep in ratio. So what's going here? Were we told that if we treated office blood pressure, our patients were gonna, uh, we are gonna reduce the mortality in them? No wonder mortality really is not affected by antihypertensive treatment, only quality of life. When we repeated this for cardiovascular outcomes, fatals and no fatals, we basically got the same thing. And when we look at stroke, because I'm very interested in, in the brain, then what we found was that again, uh, adjusted for what the, the variables I told you, everybody was significant, but when we adjusted for 24 hours, again, the automatic office blood pressure is not significant, the others are, and when we adjusted for nighttime, that's when uh, we got the, the most, the highest uh, significance, actually. So, what this is saying is, so this is total mortality, this is a graph that represents here 24 hour systolic blood pressure, and here only nighttime blood pressure. So if you look, everybody with the same nighttime blood pressure, let's say 90, which is, you would say is quite low, right? 90 for systolic blood pressure, I mean, and look at what happened across the, when you, when you look at how systolic blood pressure, 24 hour systolic blood pressure, the risk doesn't change. But when you look in the other direction, having 100 of systolic blood pressure, 100, and look at what happened when we consider the nighttime systolic blood pressure. So it's the nighttime systolic blood pressure that is giving you the higher risk. Even in individuals that have systolic of 100, in individuals that have 110, 120, and even this is, you know, at individuals 150, but nobody is gonna argue about this, but what about these points? And for, when we look only at stroke, then um, you get, again, uh, the, the 
uh, magnitude of increasing risk, although at a level, uh, at lower level. Um, so we conclude from this that higher 24 hour, and I show you just the systolic, but the diastolic, basically is the same thing. And that time blood pressures were significantly associated with higher, with greater risk of death, and a composite cardiovascular outcome and stroke. I didn't show you the composite cardiovascular outcome, but it's the same, even after adjustment for other office-based or ambulatory blood pressure measurements. So the most important indices of blood pressure are 24-hour and nighttime. These are the most important indices. If you take the blood of the uh, blood pressure in the office, and it's normal, and you take the 24 hour and the night time and abnormal, you are not treating right the patient. And the other way around, you might be over treating somebody that in the office gives you high rates, and then when you do the 24 hour or the night time, the pressure is normal. So 24-hour nighttime pressure, blood pressure may be considered optimal measurement for estimating cardiovascular risk. So why did I tell you the story about mean arterial blood pressure? And why I show you the systolic and diastolic? If I didn't show you in systolic and diastolic, nobody will believe me. But after we published that, we published the other article just based on mean arterial blood pressure. So we estimated again after 10 years of follow-up, what's the optimal threshold? This is not a statistic. This is outcome, 10 years of outcome. We found that 90 seems to be the magic number, a good threshold that separates somebody being at risk or not for a cardiovascular out, for death and for cardiovascular outcome. When we divide the individuals based on systolic blood pressure or MAP, whether they are normotensive or hypertensive, doesn't make any difference if they are normotensive by MAP. But when they are hypertensive by MAP, it doesn't make any difference the systolic. So is this is the map that is driving the classification of the patients and the risk, and whether it's the systolic or the diastolic as well. So we can classify individuals based on the risk, based on the map. And this is an example. This is 24-hour mean arterial blood pressure, and this is the 24-hour systolic blood pressure. And what you see is, again, that when you have the, um, uh, in this, the 24-hour mean arterial blood pressure and higher systolic, 24-hour systolic blood pressure, that's when the risk is higher. Here you see that the 24-hour map or mean, and this is the diastolic. And then here what you get is the lowest the lowest the diastolic blood pressure is in 24 hours, the higher the risk conferred by um, the 24 hour mean arterial blood pressure. So we think it's good to have the two indices. This is the classification, the current classification um, for the, uh, provided by the American Heart Association, American Stroke Association, and the American College of Cardiologists. And you see here, normal is less than 120 for the systolic. And elevated already 120, 129. High blood pressure, 130, 139. So this is just based basically in office blood pressure. So we keep treating this. This is what we keep treating, systolic and diastolic. And these are the proposals of our, our proposal for the MAP categories. The 90, normotension, 90 to 92, 
uh, stage one hypertension, 92 to 96, and more than 96 is the stage two hypertension. We think it's even easier to communicate this to the, particip to the patients and participants. So now we are doing some trials, we and other people, trying to get to this. So what happened when we lower the blood pressure measurements given this? And we are, of course, revising many of the old trials, but the problem is that they didn't register the map, the, the mean arterial blood pressure. So we, we believe that oscillometric blood pressure measuring devices should include the map in the reports they generate. We cannot ask the patient to have a 90 if he doesn't have a way to assess that. And if we don't have in our clinics, we don't even think about it. Considering 24-hour map in clinic practice in conjunction with 24-hour systolic blood pressure might refine risk estimates. And 24-hour nighttime blood pressure may be considered optimal measurements for estimating cardiovascular risk. So I tell you a little bit about um, blood pressure viability. But I'm gonna do it in the context of the eye because as you know, the retina is really a window to the brain from eye research to many of uh, central nervous system uh, disorders present, um, many of these disorders present ocular manifestations that reflect the condition of the brain and often precede conventional diagnosis. In fact, high blood pressure and, uh, and kidney uh, disease, hypertensive kidney disease, uh, manifest first in the eye and then in the brain as far as we can see. So um, one medical student from Maracaibo, Venezuela, took my data from the Maracaibo gene study and uh, he is the first author in this uh, paper in 2017 in ophthalmology, where we look at conventional blood pressure and ambulatory blood pressure. We took the 24-hour systolic, diastolic. At this time, I really wasn't thinking that much about the map, uh, the daytime and the nighttime. And when we look at the glaucomatous optic neuropathy is when the retinal fiber layer of the retina, which is the white matter, is thin, meaning that the white matter detracts the axons of the cells are disappearing, are damaged, and they are gonna disappear. And the, and the neurons, the granular cell layers, are, the granular cell are going to die again because if they don't have the axon to feed them, they are gonna die. And this is the origin of glaucoma. You know how many people has thin, thinner uh, retinal fiber layers, the white matter? 30%. It varies across ethnic groups. But 30% of people over 40 has very thin, retinal fiber layer. Why? When did they start? Were they born with this? Was because of blood pressure? Was because of inflammatory disease? Was because infectious? We don't know. That's part of what we are studying. But what Jesus um, discovered, and actually, um, and I'll tell you uh, what, what are the implications of this, is that when he looked at blood pressure level, ambulatory blood pressure, daytime, nighttime. None of, the, none of this was significantly related to glaucomatous damage. And it has been for a very long time known that low diastolic blood pressure, particularly at night, are a risk factor for glaucoma. So Jesus is saying, you know what? We didn't find that when we put the, the ambulatory monitoring, you know, that repeats the measurement. We didn't find that. 
what he did find was that individuals that did that the blood pressure went very extremely uh, low, either systolic or diastolic, then this was significantly related to optic, trachomatous optic neuropathy, meaning the level of blood pressure is not important here. Is how much is different between day and night. So you can have an individual that is normotensive with very low blood pressure at night when it goes to sleep, with horizontal, and then this individual is at risk of glaucoma. And we don't have targets for this, except that changing the time of the medication, of the blood pressure medication. He, he looked also at uh, variability, meaning, okay, the difference between day and night, but what about the difference between uh, sequence of measurements? And he looked at 24-hour map. Uh, this actually was, was accepted. It's in the process. It's, it has been published already. It's in, in um, so this is the 24-hour um, mean arterial pressure. This is the variability accounting for the mean of the arterial, of the mean arterial blood pressure. And this is when we consider these two. And what, what we found really is that uh, the, the mean arterial, that the variability, it's quite important for when we are looking at risk of optical neuropathy, the glaucomatous optic neuropathy. So I told you the difference between day and night, but I'm telling you also, and that's what Jesus also discovered, is that individuals that have bigger dips in the blood pressure, the higher variability, but mostly bigger dips, and for longer time, they have higher risk of um, optic neuropathy. And this is because the mean arterial blood pressure is the blood, perf the perfusion blood pressure. So we think that some individuals even don't have, or either or, don't have the ability to compensate of that, or up and down, up and down has disrupted their ability to maintain and sustain the perfusion in the eye. This is, um, Oh, this is to show that the dips and beeps, uh, that is not only how deep, but also for how long the blood pressure is down, as you might expect, right? It's not the same to have just one dip, to have uh, several dips, particularly if at night we are measuring every 30 minutes. So here then, what, I show, what I'm showing you is that this is the map and this is the variability. That at lower map, higher map variability associates with higher probability of having a glaucoma optical neuropathy or glaucomatous eye. So lower blood pressure plus higher variability. And here is just showing some examples. This is from the graphic abstract, just showing what the dips are and how different they are from somebody that uh, has um, glaucoma here and this one that has healthy eyes. And uh, he also did some, or analyzed some of the uh, visual fields and established that the the visual field, the, the damage, the eventual damage, because he also used the um, uh, example from Leuven in Belgica, in Belgica, to, in Belgium, to show that um, the progression of individuals that are normal tensive, but with these high dips and, and blips, uh, the progression is different from the visual damage um, from hypertension. 
So several questions come to place. Do we need to reframe the value of optimal blood pressure control? Nocturnal blood pressure pattern and blood pressure viability are highly associated with glaucomatous optic neuropathy in absence of elevated uh, intraocular pressure. You know, one thing is to have diabetes, like my, one patient of mine said, and the other thing is to get blind. If I get blind, I'm like, I don't want to leave. You know, somebody said to me at age, I think he was 70. And glaucoma, it's, it's not treatable. Once it's established because, hey, you know, there are no neurons anymore working. So glaucomatous optic neuropathy is a potential target for impact of tightened blood pressure control. Increased blood pressure viability and low blood pressure during hypertension treatment should not be viewed as a reason to down tritate therapy, even in the setting of a lower blood pressure goal. We need to go beyond treatment gap to reduce, to prevent, and to to look at quality of the treatment. And this, in terms of high blo the blood pressure, can only be done with a 24-hour blood pressure monitor or really sustainable, sustained home blood pressure monitor with a patient trained with a machine adequate. And this is assuming that we are going to believe in the algorithms of these machines that do not give you the math. Uh, changing to, to other topic, uh, just as a modifier of risk. So I told you about blood pressure, hopefully in some, for me, it's exciting ways uh, to be opening um, targets uh, for treatment, for prevention. But then other side of me wants to see kind of our lives in the neighborhoods better. I'm a daughter of an architect. And uh, when my father died in 2018, um, I went through that period of what I really want to do now that he's not here. I mean, he wasn't even with me anymore. I'm already old. But then I wanted to go into, I started to think a lot about the things he used to think. And I ended up doing a master's degree in neuroscience applied to architecture at the University of Venice. And these have provided me a lot of comfort, but also new tools to see, to see things, besides spending a few months in Venice. Uh, this is where we are. These are the four counties that our university is in, and they are uh, the counties with the highest poverty rates in Texas, and Star County is among the five uh, poorest counties in the country. You also see here, this uh, gray is the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease, and you see that the gray turns black because these are the, the counties with the highest prevalence of uh, dementia, Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. And yes, this is 23.2. Of course, this is Medicare fee-for-service database, so we know the limitations, but still, I didn't do this. Somebody else did it, so. So I have one question. Are our cities perpetuating isolation, inequality, apathy, and passivity? Are really our cities supporting our mental health? What about cognitive health? What about physical health? Aren't our city mostly now car-centric? Aren't our walls mostly naked in public spaces? So I started thinking about that. So I started with the help of uh, Dr. Lovasi at Drexel, looking at something called neighborhood physical disorder. There, are, there is physical and social, but I was focused on physical disorder. 
And neighborhood disorder refers to observe or perceive physical and social features of neighborhoods that may signal the breakdown of order and social control that can undermine the quality of life. It's not poverty. I'm not talking about poverty. I'm talking about neighborhood physical disorder. Well, people might be rich, but they don't have spaces to meet. They don't have spaces to walk outside their little gyms in their homes. We still need the other people. Remember the initial slides? We still need to turn to other people to be healthy. And of course, this is not my idea. Other people have been studying this for so long. And this study, for example, study the telomeres in kids, and then they look for um, association with physical disorder. This is the high disorder, and this is the, and you see the odds ratio is significant. This is concentrated disadvantage, and this is percent below poverty. This is uh, marginally significant. So, but it's really the, the disorder, high physical disorder. So this is a picture of, uh, from Google Earth, of course, from Brownsville. And you see the, the highway, right? So this highway eliminated the best part of the city, the plaza in front of the cathedral. And this just, you know, you have to cross these divided neighborhoods that have been grown together. And if you go to Brownsville, it's really car-centric. And I think that in many other places, uh, somebody, I don't know who, made the decision. I'm sure it was not the people. So we have a virtual audit suite. Uh, this is Dr. Dean Kine, who is the um, the, the owns the, I mean, this is his lab, and he, this is the places where students, with the pandemic, everybody did it at home, but basically we have a manual where we, um, you know, define how we are gonna rate each of the features and things like that. Uh, come, for example, here we have a lot of tangle lines, uh, and here are, are, are low hanging, uh, so we have different examples of uh, things that may impact the neighborhood. These are like, I don't know, like 60 pages. The students like a lot because not every student can go abroad to study. And so they do streets from all over the country and all over the, all over the, the world. They did Madrid, they did Santiago, Rio de Janeiro, Belo Horizonte, Mexico City, uh, Medellin, you name it. And now they realize that the streets of our community could be better. So one of them brought this example in Medellin, Colombia, where you see, no, really, well, you can walk here, but this is, you know, it's the same neighborhood, but look at how vibrant it is now that they changed the street they open up the walkways and they included areas where you can sit and also some people can sell the arts and crafts. This is, this is a better street and I think we deserve this. And older adults in particular need this and we don't have that. Not, in, not where we are. This is a picture of um, take it in Malmo in Sweden, and you say, yeah, but people are dancing. Yeah, Swedish can dance. You know, usually they do freelancing, but now having the, the you know, by the water, having this, you know, they are dancing tango. And what are doing these people, this was during the pandemic, and what people are doing is, you know, they are there, they are enjoying this. They are sharing, they are uh, together, although more than six feet apart. You know, but they, the fact that the city did this for the pandemia tell us something about development. And for some people, like this guy, he seems like really interested in the, 
in the exercise, in the cardiorespiratory aspect of it, but these guys don't seem to be caring about cardiorespiratory health there. You know, and, and, and this, uh, you know, I don't know, but they, they seem to be enjoying. And this was hard during the pandemic. So, and, uh, so some people say, well, but this is, you know, this is Sweden. And this is China. This was actually, I took this, um, it's, it's, it's an actual video, but I, I didn't check the, um, they have a, they say it's salsa, but it, it's, 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 it doesn't sound like salsa, but they say it's salsa. And uh, so they seem to having a lot of fun, physical exercise and, and something else that happens in your mind when you dance and when you dance with somebody that you care, you know, that you feel safe. It's like what this is happening is even better. This is in Mexico City to show the concept of a soft city. This is an, um, a slide that I got from David, C David Sin. This is Mexico City. So you're just there, have your dog there, and you know, you cannot say that Mexico City is the safest city uh, you know, in the world, but you know, it's human size at this point. And, and to say that about Mexico City, it's a lot. And this is a sweet spot in Monterrey, Mexico. So uh, we will hug again. And uh, you know, it's, it, when I read it, 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 it spoke to me. You know, it gave me hope. I needed that idea. Still, I'm waiting for some people to hug like my brother in Venezuela. So I think that's it, what I have. A big hello from all these people that hopefully you are gonna meet somehow, now, later, for your residency, for your research, for life, for fun. And this is how we unleash our inner Frida in Brownsville, an event that we have during Sombrero Festival every February. And here is my mom. Thank you. If you have any comment or question. And uh, we think that we are gonna have more eye disease than ever because of hypotension related to post-COVID and other. But I don't have data now, but uh, having experienced myself uh, long COVID, uh, it, I got a big understanding about what it's being hypotensive means. So I expect that this is gonna be happening. Hopefully, I'll get invited again, and I will report on that. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Please. I didn't hear much about the, uh, the center difference or the uh, age difference uh, from your cohort. Uh, did you notice any you know, uh, variation? Yeah. Um, do we, when we look at the different cohorts, uh, the you know, we have from China, uh, we have from Ohasama. From China, we have from Nijin, Ohasama. We have Uruguay. We have um, uh, a, a small town in Belgium, and then Maastricht. Uh, the, and we have Denmark. The country with the highest number of people treated but uncontrolled was Denmark. And Japan, you know, besides all the investments they do in, you know, and all the technology, so 
people, they do have higher rates, much higher rates of smoking in our cohort than other cohorts. So they actually, the uh, lifespan of uh, Ohasama, being such a healthy environment and they have to walk and they do, you know, Tai Chi, they eat vegetables every single, you know, time of the day. The lifespan is shorter than our cohort in Venezuela. So we believe that it's not the genetics. We believe is access to health and the definition of quality of care. So most people, most high, most people in Denmark after 50 take at least four medications. I would say that this will be almost the same here, probably. But in Venezuela, that's, that doesn't happen. So we can, we can argue about um, differential survival, that people that survive might be really strong. But um, so we don't, we haven't found any evidence that is genetic. We have found uh, evidence that is related to not even social determinants of health, but access to care and the definition of care. No, we adjusted the models for the, I would say, the traditional risk factors like this lipidem hyperlipidemia, diabetes. Um, I think we control also for anti, um, some, some drugs like uh, antipsychotics. Um, so, but um, hypertension is such a broad and widespread risk factor that it's almost impossible to have somebody with just hypertension. But it's a, it's a, it's a very interesting question because uh, indeed what we are pu putting in the bag is just the level of, of the blood pressure. And we might be talking about different um, physiopathologies. Confounders, yes. In being causal. Do you, do you look at that, for example? No, this is, this is something that we definitely want to, to get involved because, um, you know, some people, like, like my husband, he said, you know, every time you put the machine, you know, I cannot sleep well. So there might be some people that are very sensitive to this. But so that will explain the level high or low, you know, in, in the case of my husband, high, because he gets distress. Um, but what about uh, sleep apnea, for example, that is being associated with so many uh, perturbances and, uh, and uh, even um, heart function are totally related, and even dementia and, and small vessel disease. So I think that the area of sleep is just a fabulous opportunity. Yeah, I, I you know, again, I, I hope to come back and tell you more. <laughs> thank you. I just wanted to say I really enjoyed your presentation. Oh, thank you. Mm. 
Yes, no, very interesting, very interesting. So, so how you get Hall's pressure again is systolic minus diastolic. So imagine you, you have MAP and then they derive the systolic and diastolic and then you subtract that. So you get error of error of error of error. We do find association with pulse pressure and, uh, and uh, executive functioning. So um, we have data on, you know, with the DINA map, meaning, you know, measuring actually the getting the map, but uh, it's not um, either ambulatory, not office, not, not non-office, it's just in office. So having the, the pulse pressure in the office and the cognitive test that we do to our participants, it's associated. So we think that it's really when the arteries are, are so hard, are so stiff, that uh, the, somehow the, the, the response to cognitive effort is, is not fast enough. So we, we believe that, we, we only see that in, in, in relationship to executive functioning. We don't see anything in relationship to the big uh, outcomes such as death, total death, or cardiovascular death, or stroke. The other indices are, uh, you know, like erase any any significance. So I think it's 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 quite important. But we really need to get these uh, companies to, you know, to, to show us the either the algorithm or the map. to do such studies. All right, any other questions? If not, let's go ahead and thank Dr. Maestro again. Thank you. Thank you. Very kind. Thank you.